behalf of team Anajori. On behalf of team Anajori, I Akansha welcome our today's eminent speaker, Sonia J.M. Shad ma'am, to this Friday live session on the link between animal cruelty and uh, human violence. She is the co-founder and, and chief operating officer at Integro. She is the founder of Society for Non-Human Persons and uh, she is the former manager at Animal Law Center, Nalsar. She has worked at Mercy for Animals at the, uh, the Human Society at the national as well as at the international platforms. Today's evening is going to be very enlightening because we have with us Sonia Mapp. For the audience who are new to our platform, I'd like to introduce briefly about Anna Jury to them. Anna Jury is a nonprofit platform and aims to promote various initiatives that attempt to bring social change, sharpen leadership skills, and build entrepreneurial in Assam as well as in Northeast. Through the webinar series, which was started in July last year, that is in uh, 2021, we try to build a network among people in Northeast by inviting speakers from various fields to join us in. Through the webinar, uh, we will get to know more about the organization. I'd like to start our today's session with the opening speech by Sonia, ma'am, ma'am, please. Um... Hi everyone, I'm Sonia. I'm gonna take you through the link between animal cruelty and human violence today. Um, I also wanna thank Anna Jory and the Animal Law Center for the opportunity to talk about something that I really care deeply about. Um, and if uh, today, just a quick note about today's session. Today's session can be triggering. We will be covering animal cruelty, sexual assault and sexual offenses, child abuse, murder, serial crimes, violence, um, domestic violence, inter-partner violence, and a lot of other triggering topics. If you feel triggered, if you feel drop off, mute me, come back when you're ready, do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable. I will try and give you a trigger warning if I'm discussing an individual instance of cruelty or explaining a, um, a particular instance. I cannot give you a trigger warning for every time I mention these topics because they are going to be mentioned throughout this session today. So if you do, um, need a moment, take a moment, I will not be offended, even if you drop off the call, it's perfectly fine. Um, would it be all right if I began? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, Oops. I did not do that, right? Um... Is there any problem, ma'am? Yeah. No, I think I got it this time. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, one second. Something has gone weird. I'm not able to. Nope, I do that. Oh, there we go. Um, here we go. Can everyone see it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. right, that's awesome. Okay, great. Um, okay, so to start off today, we're going to be discussing the link between animal cruelty and human violence. And I hope that through today's session, you can all see how everything is connected. All right, so I am going to start off by understanding what, oh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to start off by explaining to everyone what the basics of animal cruelty is. Animal cruelty encompasses a variety of actions and the lack of actions as well. So today I'm going to start off by what animal cruelty is or how animal cruelty is defined under the law. This is important because we need to understand how the law defines animal cruelty to understand what we can do about it. And that'll become relevant in the last bit of our session today. But for all intents and purposes, um, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act defines what animal cruelty is. Section 11 covers a wide variety of acts. It includes acts like beating, kicking, overriding, overloading, torturing, um, giving animals injurious substances or non-prescribed medical substances, abandoning an animal, starving an animal, not giving them water or shelter, um, tying them up for very long periods of time, not allowing them movement, animal fighting, 
all of that is encompassed by section 11 of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. The act includes both active and passive cruelty. What I mean by active cruelty is when you actively do something that's mean. So um, hitting an animal. So if I were to go take a stick and, and hit an animal on the head, that would be an active form of animal cruelty. But if I forgot to feed my dog and give my dog water for a month, that would be what I call passive. Okay, so today's session, when we talk about the link, is going to be focused on what I call active uh, acts of animal cruelty. So it would be a perpetrator committing an act of violence against an animal, and that's what our session will look at primarily today. But there are loads of different forms of animal cruelty. The last thing I wanted to just draw your attention to um, when we talk about animal cruelty in the law is the idea of unnecessary pain and suffering. It is illegal to commit acts that are that put animals under unnecessary pain and suffering. But the problem is the definition of unnecessary pain and suffering isn't really listed out well. So when it comes to understanding what unnecessary animal pain and suffering would be, we can look at other laws, rules, guidelines, um, precedents set by courts, and even scientific arguments as to what would be considered cruelty and whether that's necessary. Okay, so this is just the very, very first part. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to the, can I proceed? Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'm going to proceed then. Um, the first time the link between animal cruelty and human violence was identified was in 1751. That's about, I don't know, 250, more than 250 years ago, right? So it's not new. Hogarth was a man who created a set of four paintings or artworks where he depicted the first one was the first stage of cruelty, where you can see a man is torturing a dog. The images aren't very clear because they're very old and I've had to expand them. So I'm just going to tell you what's happening on the screen. But if you look them up online, you might be able to find clearer versions of it. So in stage one, or what he calls the first stage of cruelty, we can see a dog being tortured by a person. The same person then goes on to kill a horse. The next stage of the cruelty is that they moved on to killing a human. And the last stage, or what he calls the reward of cruelty, is this person being um, himself put to the gallows and killed for his acts of violence. So Hogarth kind of illustrated this graduation of violence that he saw. And this is not particularly relevant to the four stages of cruelty. But what I found really in interesting is Hogarth uh, printed and distributed these images at a very, very low cost to try and generate um, awareness about how the link um, between violence, sorry, the link between animal cruelty and human violence works. Now, in order to understand the size of the link, the impact of this link, we're going to look at a couple of statistics, all right? All right, so the first one is in Canada, they have noticed that 70% of um, violent criminals began with animal cruelty. In South Africa, 63% began with animal cruelty. In Australia, 95% of people who um, had either murdered, raped, committed assault, theft, and drug crimes um, also had a history of animal cruelty. In the South Pacific, it was 62% for assaults, 90% for violence, property, and drug crimes, and 100% for sexual homicides. Okay, in the United in the United States, it's about 63% for violent crimes overall and 70% for combined violence, theft, um, drug crimes, disorderly conduct, etc. The reason, now, as you can see, these numbers slightly differ, right? But what is not, uh, what is clear from these numbers that we can see is that there is a definite link between animal cruelty and human violence. No matter how you play it, no matter which country you go to, no matter what study you read, the link is evident in all of them. So the question is not even um, whether or not the link exists. 
The only question is how bad or how significant is this link? And that we can understand sort of by trying and compiling studies. So there is a study available online where, um, and I will send the name across to the organizers so that they can share it with you all if they can, um, where they talk about a metadata study where they analyzed all the studies that were done and came up came up with approximate numbers. And it's these approximate numbers that I've used in the rest of this presentation. But I found that study the most helpful to understand the link in detail. All right. Um, I'm going to go, okay. So we're gonna to go to the next set, which is trying to understand how this link plays out in reality, right? For what crimes are commonly committed alongside animal cruelty. And there are four, broad topics we can put this link under. The first one is domestic violence or interpartner violence. Um, the second one that we will look into today is child abuse. The third one is sexual offenses. And the fourth one is murder and other violent crimes. So we're gonna cover how the link works in these four categories of crimes and violent acts. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, if you have a question, I will be able to answer it. Also, can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, awesome. Um, so the first thing we're gonna look at is domestic violence. The link between intimate partner violence and animal abuse was seen to range between 25 and 86%. Now, one of the reasons for this wide range is because in different countries and different cultures, not all of them will have pets and not all of them will see animals in the same way. That can explain one of the reasons why there's such a wide variation in this statistic, right? Um, when we look at this statistic, now that we know they occur together, it's also important to understand how this co-occurring impacts each of the victims in the situation. So if pets were threatened, that means an animal wasn't hurt, but let's say um, a partner threatened to kill the animal if the victim in that relationship wanted to leave it, women were seven times more likely to delay moving to a safe place. Okay. Now, if we look at what happens when pets are actually abused in the relationship, women are eight times more likely to delay moving to a safe place. Over 50% of victims of domestic violence crimes were forced to leave their pet with the abuser. And many of these women will go back to the abuser out of concern for their pets. What is also interesting that we that you won't that I haven't written down here, but I find interesting is the fact that when you are in a traumatic situation, your bond with other victims in the same traumatic situation becomes stronger. So the care that these women feel towards their pets is often stronger. And that's why they feel this intense tie to go back in many of these cases. Okay, now animal cruelty can also be used as a means of coercion. So an abuser could threaten to um, harm an animal if a victim refuses to do something the abuser asked. And this manifests itself in other criminal ways, which is so important because the governments need to understand this and policymakers need to understand this because animal cruelty can be used as a way to control a victim into, control, into carrying out other crimes, all right? And this again is an important factor that I think we should know about, which is in cases involving domestic abuse and family violence, the perpetrator is more likely to commit violence um, on other people in the same environment, not just animals, right? So usually in a house with violence, animals, children, women, elderly people will all simultaneously be subject to abuse and cruelty. Now that we've talked about the adult side of the domestic violence and family violence aspect, we will go to the child side, all right? So child abuse and animal cruelty has a very, very high link, both forwards and backwards. And we'll get into how it works forward and backwards in a second, but let's first understand how it links together. Okay, so in a study carried out in New York, 88% of families uh, where children were victims of abuse, there was also animal cruelty evident. 
two thirds of the violence that was carried out towards animals was said to be carried out by the perpetrator of the child abuse or the father. And in one third of those circumstances, it was carried out by the children themselves. This is important to understand because it helps us understand how violence transfers. In 2019, there was a study carried out which said that 90.7% of um, maternal caregivers noticed that, um, sorry, just one second. I can't even see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, reported that children in homes with violence were also witnessing or animals being abused or were witnessing that children um, see threats of violence towards animals, especially in homes with interpersonal violence. So even if the child wasn't being abused in that situation, if the home has interpersonal violence, the child is watching the abuse and is often watching the abuse of the animals as well. This poses a serious risk to the safety of the children because in 51 to 78 percent of cases children will intervene to protect yeah. the animals even in cases where um, firearms are being used and in cases where there is a serious risk of injury to them so even if there's a gun involved a child will is very likely to intervene in that situation even if they are likely to get hurt in other cases, children will try to take steps prior to the abuse occurring, which means they'll hide um, mistakes that the animal has committed so the animal doesn't experience that violence. Or alternatively, they will try to comfort the animal after the abuse. In 12.3% of cases, so in about, yeah, about 12% of the cases, um, Threats and violence towards animals was used as a means to coerce the children into compliance or silence when they were being abused. This, this graph that we can see above kind of helps us understand the statistic we read about the New York study, where we realized that in homes with interpersonal violence and um, child abuse, the children are likely to commit violence. It's not just the person carrying out the violence that is likely to commit it. Here we can see that abused children are significantly more likely to abuse an animal. In the case of boys, it's one is to seven. So if a boy is being abused, he's seven times more likely to abuse an animal. And in the case of a girl, it's about more than five times. She's more than five times more likely to commit violence against an animal or cruelty towards an animal. These statistics are a lot. I know they are. Um, so it, it's, it's a lot. Uh, if you need me to pause anywhere, let me know. But there is a lot of evidence, as you can see, especially in the cases of domestic violence and child abuse, where we can see the link is so clearly displayed. And in the case of child abuse, it's even more interesting because the link works both ways. So abuse leads to animal cruelty and animal cruelty um, around children is a form of abuse and is a marker of abuse. Right, now we can go to sexual offenses. Huh. Okay, so when it comes to serial rapists and the word serial is again important here and sexual homicide perpetrators, they are very likely to have a high incidence of um, uh, cruelty towards animals in their childhood. That means they were likely to have committed acts of cruelty against children. Um, in a study that looked into the co-occurrence rates of animal cruelty and sexual offenses, they found that 30% of pedophiles and 48% of rapists started off with animal cruelty. It's also important here to note that there are other studies in the world and some of these studies have put the, the correlation of pedophilia and animal cruelty at 100%. Um, but those were slightly smaller studies, so I haven't included the statistics here, but again, the ranges vary. And 40% of sexual homicide perpetrators admitted that they had been sexually abused and that they had engaged in sexual contact with animals. So again, you can see that victims of abuse, as you can see here, right? So when they were victims of child of sexual abuse as children, they were more likely to A, perpetrate sexual violence towards adults and B, perpetrate sexual violence towards animals. 
now we're going to go to murder and other serious crimes and then we won't have to <laughs> focus too much on the numbers um when it comes to murder and other serious crimes the link is quite high the following crimes are most likely to co-occur with animal cruelty these include murder murderers particularly serial killers school shooters mass murderers um etc and we also have um robbery assault rape harassment threats drug possession battery etc are all crimes that are associated with a history of animal abuse in the 1970s i don't know how many of you have watched mind hunter but if you have that's kind of what the show is based on this um fbi study uh in the 1970s they basically studied 36 uh, serial murderers and they were able to recognize the link between animal cruelty and repeated acts of violence against humans throughout this entire session we keep hearing the word repeated acts because repeated acts are a good indicator of how people are going to behave and animal abusers compared to people who haven't abused animals were three times more likely to have committed other offenses when compared to people who had never been who had never abused an animal okay so right now we've covered four important things one is animal cruelty and domestic violence is very common as a correlation um child abuse and animal cruelty is common both ways both um where children are perpetrators and children are victims of abuse themselves the third one is with respect to sexual offenses and the fourth one is murder and other serious crimes that include violence all right so now in order to understand how this violence transfers it's interesting to see how people start off with violence so a lot of people here might have killed an insect right but i'm assuming no one here is a serial murderer um or a, any other kind of violent criminal but a lot of people kill insects right um then why does what why does someone move on to an animal if you could just if killing things was your biggest joy in life just kill 100 ants right wouldn't that be more satisfying but people move on to animals and i like to think of it as a coefficient right between risk and satisfaction so most people will start off with the easiest target right it wouldn't make sense to go to uh, the wwe champion of the world and be like you know what you're going to be my first murder victim you wouldn't do that and the chance is you wouldn't do that because that victim or that person the likelihood of you getting injured and the risk to you is much higher right so remember the coefficient is risk but the other coefficient is satisfaction the amount of intensity of emotion that you would get from killing an insect versus an animal is definitely different and the amount that and if that is true then we can see that okay maybe i will start my first victim will be an insect right it's the easiest thing to kill what's the next easiest thing to kill an animal the next one the next easiest target is a child woman and then an elderly person so all these people are easy targets and and perpetrators will usually start with the easiest target and then move on to a target that's slightly harder that gives them a higher reward internal reward not overall reward but internal reward right and this brings us to our first theory that explains violence which is the violence graduation hypothesis the violence graduation hypothesis is also called the first strike theory and you'll you'll see the first strike theory in other animal protection organizations mandates and things like that this is what they're talking about okay um it states that perpetrators of violence often begin with animals and then they will progress to violence against human victims animal cruelty is seen as a rehearsal for human directed violence and um in developmental terms essentially it says that animal cruelty in childhood is an incremental step towards violence directed at humans in adulthood one of the reasons people think that the violence graduation hypothesis makes sense is because um to a large extent many individuals see animals as more far removed than humans right so um the the amount of bond that a person will have with an animal or they see animals as lesser species 
or not as important or not as significant, right? And so it's easier to start with them and it's more distant and then people will keep graduating towards what they believe is more like them. Um, I, I just wanted to explain that um, when we look at it this way, it is possible that some people think this way, but not all of them do, right? Um, so we'll see how it works for other people as well. So the violence graduation hypothesis, again, remember uh, Hothgarth's four images? Right? He's talking about the same context, the violence graduation hypothesis. And this was one of the first theories that explained the link between animal cruelty and human violence. In order to understand the next theory or the newest theory, we're gonna look at Genghis Khan. So Genghis Khan had been at war with China for about 20 years. And um, apart from this plan being a brilliant military strategy, he basically asked China for a gift of 10,000 swallows. So swallows are basically like messenger birds. And when you release them, they go back to where they're from uh, as a gift. And he would leave the, the people alone if they did that. He took the 10,000 swallows, uh, trigger warning animal cruelty. He took the 10,000 swallows, doused them in flammable material, tied string around their legs and set them on fire so that they could go back and he could win the war. It's, it's a interesting military strategy. But what I want us to look at in this perspective was Genghis Khan had killed thousands of humans before he attempted this. That doesn't really fit in with the violence graduation hypothesis, does it? One of the reasons, or at least personally, I believe with respect to Genghis Khan, it seems like violence kind of just stopped mattering to him. Cruelty didn't make that much of a difference, whether it was an animal or a human, he was comfortable with violence and cruelty. And that's why he carried out these acts. Which brings us to the next theory, which is the deviance generalization hypothesis. The deviance generalization hypothesis states that animal cruelty is seen as a part of a cluster of anti-social behaviors, and it's used as an indicator for other forms of criminal and violent behavior. It says, Violence is not so cut and dry. It's not as simple as um, I see an animal as a lower species, so I killed it first, or an animal was just the easiest victim, so I killed it first, then I killed a human, right? It says that violence, animal cruelty, they, they have a comprehensive list of factors that impact it, and they interact in different ways. So it may not be as, always as cut and dry as first animal, then human, right? And it's seen as a co-occurring action with other forms of violence and criminal behavior. So that is the violence graduation hypothesis. It's also interesting to note that there were a group of um, researchers and academics that had published studies that supported the first strike theory or the violence graduation hypothesis who carried out more studies and then in their opinion, um, stated that the violence graduation hypothesis is not accurate and the deviance generalization hypothesis is accurate. So if you are talking about this from your perspective, I strongly advocate that you consider the generalized deviance hypothesis over the first strike theory because there is more evidence that supports the generalized deviance hypothesis. Um, of course, there's always room for more studies. So maybe we're not 100% sure which one might be the best way to explain this. Now we're going to also look at, now that we understand the theories of violence, oops, no, no, there we go. Now that we understand the theories of violence, let's try and see what impact violence has on individuals, right? Um, the first one is that even if you are a witness to animal abuse or trauma, um, it, it results in uh, antisocial behaviors and other psychological disorders in children, like depression and anxiety. And it also increases the chance of them externalizing this violence. Another impact of um, animal abuse is it desensitizes the perpetrator from violence. Remember Genghis Khan, everyone? Um, it desensitizes the perpetrator from the effects of violence. So they're more comfortable committing other crimes. This is also the reason why in Sparta, in order to become a official soldier or a man, uh, they would have to first kill an animal, right? Because it helps desensitize a person to the effects of violence. 
Now, is it true that every person that commits animal cruelty will, I don't know, hurt a human? Not exactly, no. But we can use animal abuse as a marker to identify other forms of violence. So one, remember the word recurrent, we kept hearing earlier, recurrent sexual offenses, recurrent animal abuse, etc. That is because recurrent animal abuse results in a higher incidence of individuals committing criminal offenses. So for example, we can take the converse of it, right? Now imagine um, there was a 10 year old kid who tied uh, one of those patakas, right? During Diwali, they tied it to the tail of a dog and they burst it, right? Uh, the child may not have comprehended the extent of suffering. They may not have seen an animal as a person, et cetera. But they grow up a little bit and they feel really bad about what they've done and they never want to hurt another animal again. That is not really a good marker for whether that person is going to commit additional criminal acts, right? So you want to see recurrent animal cruelty leads to recurrent violence. So any reoccurrence of violence, the more someone commits violence, the more likely they are to commit violence again. So the term recurrent is very, very important to us to factor in when we're trying to anticipate whether someone is going to commit other violent crimes. The factors that lead to violence are often the same regardless of the species of the victim. And it usually is a result of the misuse of perpetrator's power over the victim. So basically, let's say this, let's go back to the domestic violence statistics that we read, right? If there is a violent, I'm sorry, I keep using man as an example because a lot of studies do for domestic violence. Um, anyone can be a victim of violence. But for the purpose of this explanation, I'm going to just say man. So um, let's say a man is likely to hit their child and hit their wife. It is not, it's not surprising that they'll also be okay with killing or hitting an animal, right? It, it's not about who the victim is. It's about who the perpetrator is. If a perpetrator is violent, they will commit violent, violence on any victim that they can, as long as it meets the risk versus satisfaction metric, right? Um, the next thing is it shows us that human victims and animal victims are prone to victimization by the same perpetrator. Again, let's go back to the domestic violence example. In a house where one there is an abuser, he's likely to abuse everybody in the house if he can, right? The fourth really important thing about using animal abuse as a marker is you can, again, reverse engineer the process. You don't always have to use it to find... Uh, I don't have the ability to mute participants. Whoever's the host, can you mute the person? Priyanka, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, all right. So the next thing is we can reverse engineer the process. Not only can you use a marker of animal cruelty to identify people who might be perpetrators, you can use animal cruelty to identify other victims. So if you see a child committing animal cruelty, the probability that that child has been abused is very high. If you see animal abuse in a house, the probability that um, there is domestic violence or child abuse is also very high. So you can reverse engineer the process to actually help victims, not just identify perpetrators. And this becomes, um, the premise of the whole point of this, right? Which is the solution to a violent society is not the characterization of the victims, but the characterization of the perpetrators. This is why victim-centric measures do not work because victims are not the problem, right? So when you have all of the, oh, don't, uh, don't dress a particular way because that will prevent sexual assault or do this, that will prevent, when you tell victims what to do to prevent abuse or violence, et cetera, it doesn't work because the victims are not the source of the violence. The victims are basically the easiest, most convenient victim that this perpetrator could find. Mm -hmm. If this victim isn't available, they will find another one. 
So you are not reducing violence by mm. giving victims mm. means for protecting themselves. The only way to reduce violence is to understand how perpetrators carry out this violence and what you can do to prevent perpetrators from doing so or how can you prevent perpetrators from being male. Right? All right. So this... Um, sorry, I'm not just one second. All right. Oh, this was a very fast session. Okay. So um, this brings us to our next thing before we go on, which is, although the statistics are pretty clear on, let's go back for a second. Statistics are really clear, right? It's definitely a way you can identify perpetrators. I wanted to take you through the next example of Adolf Hitler. Hitler was a vegetarian, but he killed over a million people and tortured, I don't know how many people, right? Statistics tell us probability there are going to be exceptions. So every person that is an animal abuser, there's not a 100% guarantee that they're going to abuse a human. They're just very likely to, and vice versa. Just because someone abuses humans doesn't mean it's a guarantee that they would have abused an animal. It just makes it extremely likely. So it's really important to not take statistics as blanket rules and to leave some room for exceptions. All right. Now, how can we use the link to mitigate and reduce violence in society? Okay. The first one is that you can prosecute animal abuse and it will act as a deterrent for further acts of violence, not, against, not only against humans, but also against animals as well. So every time you, you prosecute animal abuse or you prosecute any kind of abuse for that matter, you are, you are creating a deterrence for a person to commit or a perpetrator to commit an act of violence. Now, the second thing you can utilize the link for is to identify other victims. So children who are committing animal abuse are usually victims of abuse. So that's one way you can identify them. And what becomes useful in this situation is to provide them with effective support, prevention, and taking steps to prevent further abuse from occurring against them. And there are also studies that show that therapy and counseling can prevent children from escalating into other forms of violence. This is really important because when you see um, children committing acts of animal cruelty, if you are an animal activist, it can become very easy for you to become angry, frustrated, and want punishment for the child. But there are multiple studies that show that criminal punishment, particularly for children and adolescents, does not reduce the likelihood of them committing violence, but it increases the likelihood of them committing violence. So especially when it comes to children and you're trying to work on this issue, think about how you can help the child develop alternative tools instead of externalizing the violence and what you can do to help the child. Okay. The next thing is you can use it to protect other unseen victims, right? So um, we can take the example of a couple of states in New York, right? Oops. Um, we can take the example of a couple of states in New York where uh, in the case of domestic, sorry, in the US, uh, in the case of domestic violence calls, the police will not only remove the woman and the child from that house or that environment, but they will also take the animal out of that environment, which then increases the chance of the woman staying away from the perpetrator, increases the likelihood the woman will be able to um, report the abuser and follow through on that because the coercion aspect is reduced, right? So there are ways you can create legal policies that recognize this link to benefit both humans and animals. Now, um, before we go to the last part, um, policy is a really, really effective way to change things, but you don't have to do things through just policy. Right? So even if the um, government of India is not going to make a law tomorrow that says, okay, now when police respond to domestic violence calls, they must also take animals. Even if they can't do that, simple things that you can do that are non-legal is to help domestic violence shelters and animal shelters tie up together, right? Or to encourage domestic violence shelter to allow the person to bring their animal for a night until they can find a shelter that can take them small changes that you can bring forth even without 
going as high as the policy level decision will make an impact. And it's important to try and understand how different welfare spaces can work together to mitigate the most amount of violence and suffering in society. Now the last one is how can you help? And then I will open it up for questions in case anyone has any. The first thing you can do to help is to report and follow through with the process when you see someone commit animal cruelty. There are multiple studies that show us that certainty of punishment is a much bigger disincentive when it when compared to quantific or the quantity of punishment, right? So for example, if I if I put it this way and I say if a hundred percent of um, people who committed robberies or not even 100, even if 95% of people who committed robberies necessarily had would get caught and go to prison for six months or one month or whatever that is, versus 1% um, of robbers who get caught get the death penalty, robbery would be way less in situation one than it would be in situation two. So even though the penalties in India are ridiculously low, reporting and following through with the process will make a massive impact on how comfortable perpetrators are committing cruelty, right? And again, when I say report and follow through with the process, I do not mean, you know, tag an animal protection organization or, uh, you know, call up a shelter and say, hey, this person is being cruel to an animal. What I mean is you go report it to the police and you follow through with the process. It'll take you a couple of hours, yes, but it's not as difficult as it seems. And many animal welfare organizations offer sessions where they will teach you how to do this, or um, you can look it up online and they, and they have like hotlines and call centers that will talk you through the process because of how the legal system works. An animal protection organization is not an authority. So they can't uh, prosecute anyone. They, they can't arrest anyone. They don't have the authority to do that. And how the legal system works is also important here because um, a third party reporting a crime has a lot less weightage than someone who witnessed it firsthand. So the probability, even if the police decides to investigate it, the probability of that person being convicted in court drops significantly if it's a third party. So if you witness it yourself or you got, if you have firsthand information, you can make a big positive change by simply reporting what you have seen to the right authority. The second thing you can do is you can support policy changes. You can do that through petitions, letters to your representative. You can do it through increasing awareness, resharing posts on Instagram of other animal protection organizations, et cetera. A good example of this would be the No More 50 campaign, which is currently going around in India, which is trying to increase the penalties of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. The next important thing that you can do is you can leave animals off your plate whether it's dairy or meat or whatever that may be. First, it really helps the animals. That's the easiest way to help animals is just don't eat them. But do it to the best of your ability. Again, remember the numbers matter here. So it is better to, to be someone who will try and replace animal products. Um, and that is a good, significant, important act you can take, even if you can't go vegan. It's okay if you cannot do something perfectly, but do it to the best of your ability. And if all of us do it to the best of our ability, the total amount will come down and the total number of animals harmed will come down. Another really important reason to do this is because slaughterhouses and animal husbandry have people in it. It's an industry where people are forced to commit violence or violent acts against animals. Um, and it's part of their job, but no matter what you do, no matter how you rationalize it, committing acts of cruelty against animals or committing any act of cruelty or violence has a significant impact on those individuals. It affects their mental health, it affects their safety, it affects the family, the safety of their families. So even from a human welfare perspective, it is important to consider reducing the number of um, animals on your plate, right? Now, the fourth one is if you work or volunteer in a welfare space, use intersectionality to plan your work and collaborate with organizations in your welfare space and other welfare spaces. The problem of violence is, is extremely large, right? 
and cruelty and the lack of human welfare and animal welfare is, is it's a massive problem but the problems are interconnected whether you talk about environmental protection and animal agriculture or animal cruelty and human violence most problems are interconnected so utilize the people that are on your side that may not be working the exact same way you do or in an area that's slightly different than yours and work together to bring forth changes because if we stay in silos a our numbers are way smaller than what they actually are and the impact we can achieve is way less and b the policies that we will come up with the changes that we come up with the ideas that we come up with are going to be incomplete they are going to miss really important ways right so domestic violence organizations might be working to to help um women leave their partners or create more uh, women shelters etc right but if the policy doesn't include the aspects of animal cruelty that play into domestic violence it doesn't holistically cover everything and it doesn't protect everyone it in fact reduces the protection even to the women because they're more likely to go back to their abusers because the animals won't take out of that situation right so it's very important that we as activists and people who work in the welfare space we are intersectional and we are collaborative across your space and across other welfare spaces there are commonalities and common ground find them and work together the lo- the next one is utilize your voice and stand up against all forms of violence it doesn't matter which kind of violence you're working to reduce because as we have seen from today's session it doesn't matter how you reduce the violence any reduction in violence anywhere will lead to an overall reduction of violence in society and will lead to the better protection of all victims so wherever you can utilize your voice your abilities your privilege whatever you may have to stand up against all forms of violence you can any change you make will make a positive change for everyone and the last one and what i believe is the most important one is we've we've kind of understood through this entire present presentation is that often times people who have experienced abuse will externalize that abuse and in the case of children it's important to provide them with support structures that help them heal so that they don't feel the need to externalize this abuse but as adults we are all responsible for our own behavior and we are responsible for our own healing if we do not take our own healing seriously we will externalize our trauma on other people maybe not through violence but through other forms of negative behaviors which will again continue to perpetuate a negative cycle if if all you can do is work on healing yourself whatever that may mean whether that's therapy whether that's movement whatever way works for you right you will create a positive change in the world because you will not unintentionally externalize violence and um, even though hurt people hurt people heal people heal people so so to the best of your ability work on healing your own trauma so that you are able to end the cycle of um violence and trauma with you um so that's all i have for today's session if anyone has any questions please let me know Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your views with us uh, through your presentation. We got to know some of the new things. So I'd like to ask uh, ask you some of the questions. Like you have mentioned about the link between animal cruelty and uh, human violence, and uh, how the crime occurs through, like for example, child abuse and domestic violence or sexual offences and uh, violence. So my question is, uh, how does violence transfer between uh, humans and animals, and what is the impact of witnessing um, animal cruelty? Okay, so um, the impact of witnessing animal cruelty. Let's let's start with how violence transfers, right? So the thing is, uh, most people who experience violence uh, will need to deal with it some way, right? And a lot of them choose to externalize that violence. And we talked about this link earlier, so I'm just gonna. go back in my slides to show you how violence transfers um and i don't know how many of you all watched the oscars where uh, chris rock got slapped but he's a good example of 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 understanding how violence transfers right so there are a lot of people talking about it and should he have done it should he not have done it is kind of irrelevant for this discussion but what is interesting is what the act that he committed right 
theory did not just stem from that situation. It stemmed from his own discontent, discontentment and friction within his own marriage which he then externalized onto Chris Rock, because again, remember, ease of victim is a big factor, right? So when you have all of that violence, anger, frustration, it gets externalized, and who does it get externalized onto depends on that matrix between convenience and satisfaction. So that's how violence gets transferred. When it comes to what happens when you witness violence, witnessing violence leads particularly children to commit acts of violence. And um, it also, I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. But um, it also leads to depression, anxiety. You don't, so for example, um, even if you were not abused as a child, even if there was no other form of violence around you except animal cruelty, your likelihood of, of uh, recreating trauma, recreating violence or externalizing violence is higher your likelihood of developing anxiety, depression, personality disorders is higher. Um, it also impacts everyone, okay? So remember violence, violence isn't special. It doesn't just uh, hurt people who are women and children. People working in slaughterhouses, people who go to war, people who have to deal with violence as part of their jobs, as part of any experience that they, they go through. Um, will have an impact of that violence and they will be affected by it and there are different kinds of studies that show us this but anyone who witnesses violence or partakes in violence is impacted by the violence a hundred percent of the time the degree to which they are impacted varies and there aren't enough studies to tell us why this varies and i, I think it's really fascinating if i could study the factors that that trigger off externalization of violence, I would. Um, but currently there aren't any studies that explain it to us in detail, although you can come up with a couple of ideas about why that happens. So in that case, can we consider animal abuse as a predictor of future behavior against human violence? Sorry, uh, it, can be as, as, it can be used as, um, it can be used as a marker, but again, I would say look for repeated instances of animal cruelty. That's a much higher marker than an individual instance. So it can be used to determine whether someone will commit future crimes. But again, with respect to understanding the statistics have exceptions, I would hesitate to tell you it's a blanket rule. I would say be aware of it and, and think that it's likely and, and check to see if there are other crimes being committed. But um, to assume with 100% certainty is something I would advise against. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, there is a question for you. Uh, someone, uh, Aradam Belai. So the question. Okay, so that's actually really. Okay, so the Hitler example um, is 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 fascinating, and there are different theories that explain it. In fact, um, we we did this in the Masters program. Um, that okay, so there is an MA Masters program uh, offered by Nalsar on um, animal protection laws, and I recently did this session with our MA students in more detail and as, as a bigger exercise, and we discussed Hitler in detail. So um, I got this from the students, so full credit to the students in my class. Um, but there were two things that they brought up to explain Hitler's behavior. One was something I'd already read, which was the uh, Hitler like dogs in particular, but generally this animal welfare perspective of Hitler was something done as a PR stunt to kind of explain why Hitler is not a bad person and to help uh, the international community feel better about what was going on, especially in the beginning stages, and to also kind of present Hitler as a kind person or a good person in some way. The other one that I found interesting that um, I think Stuti from my class had mentioned, she pointed out that one of the reasons why Hitler might have liked animals more is because the higher obedience levels 
um, particularly like dogs, they are more obedient and they follow orders better and they don't contradict you or conflict with you and they're loyal, things like that, that a person who's a dictator like Hitler might have enjoyed. So, so that's why we, I mean, those are the ideas we came up with. There isn't a lot of um, research on this particular topic again. So it, it's difficult to, to state that it's ideology versus transference. Uh, but ideology is a factor on why people choose their victims, the way they choose their victims. Um, and a tendency towards it is basically repeated. So repeated acts of violence desensitizes you towards violence, which makes violence more acceptable and therefore makes it easier for you to propagate violence. So the way people develop a tendency is usually they see violence in any form or they experience violence on themselves. And that causes them to externalize it Again, not everyone does, right? So you find a lot of trauma victims that are very nice people that want to help people and all of that stuff. So it's not 100% guaranteed. Um, and the other factors that impact whether or not someone will externalize it versus heal it is, is still needs to be studied. It hasn't been studied yet. Um, but that's, that's how I believe it works. Um, the more violence you commit and the more violence that occurs around you, the more normalized violence becomes. And then once you start committing it, the more you commit it, the tendency to commit more violence becomes higher. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Teja. <laughs> uh, so that was a good presentation. I really liked how you summarized the whole uh, white paper. <laughs> Uh, my, I have two questions for you. Um, when we go to your last slide's suggestions, and I like how they're very um, and not just talking about law, but also about individuals and how each of them can help. My, fir my first question is about uh, the very first suggestion, right? Uh, that the most effective mechanism is to uh, just report the crime. So in the current space uh, in the current ways that the policy uh, works, is the process uh, cognizant of the links between uh, the repeated links between uh, perpetrator, victim, uh, and then perpetrator of violence, uh, and how violence also translates from one person to species and to species to person. Um, is, is it cognizant of this link? Um, um, because I'm just afraid if um, someone who has been a victim of violence themselves uh, and who continue this uh, cycle is then criminalized um, and uh, whether that would really, really give them the rehabilitation and counseling uh, space that they really need? Uh, Teja, that's a really good question. And for anyone um, who hasn't met Teja before, Teja was the first person that I worked on the subject with. And um, we both had a terrible and a good time learning about this together. Um, so Teja's question is interesting because we actually don't recognize the link at all in India. And that is quite sad. In fact, there's only one study in India that talks about an individual case of a child that, not a child, an 18 year old, so I guess an adolescent um, that had committed an, I think, uh, bestiality and then killed the calf or something like that. Yeah. Or trigger warning everyone. Um, but in that case, that particular kid got lucky. Um, there was a psychiatrist who was able to help him and who wrote a paper on this and was able to get him assistance. In most cases, it's it doesn't work like this. The kid was a abuse of sexual, uh, I mean, mm, violence. Was a sexual violence. violence kid, yeah. yeah. So the thing is that we don't recognize it at all. So I would, when I talk about reporting instances of animal cruelty, I'm talking about reporting it on an adult level right? So you report adults who commit acts of violence. Uh, when it comes to kids, I genuinely think you should think it through and see if there's a better way you can help that child. Because we don't recognize it. Our entire criminal justice system is designed to be punitive and not reformatory, even though it claims to be to a certain extent. This is a problem across the board. And there are other countries we can learn from, I think, a couple of European countries as well that they do a very good job of reformative justice. And um, we don't, like we don't recognize this link to the extent that 
even in the crime databases where they track different kinds of crimes and and repeat offenders in different ways animal cruelty is not even on that list there is no tracking of all the animal cruelty uh, complaints or crimes that are occurring in india right now um unlike other forms of um crimes that are violent so so we don't recognize the link at all and when it comes to children i genuinely think if it's possible try and involve a child rights organization or someone who might be able to advocate for the child as well um and and be very gentle if possible but the solution is also not to ignore it when you see it try and see if there are other forms of cruelty occurring um see if there's something you can do about it and and etc but when it comes to reporting please report every adult that you see because if you don't report them there are probably other victims on the line some of which are children as well so if you see an adult victimize anyone please report them adults are responsible for their own healing unfortunately not everyone has access to it and we can only do whatever we can within the current legal framework but we can also push for more friendly policies so so push for more reformative justice policies um try and ensure that juvenile um detention centers and um, juvie and stuff have better welfare policies for children wherever possible again everything works together there is no way to do one without another and i would say do a combination of all of the things i recommended and use your discretion to see which one would work out or when to act in the best interest of the people who are victims particularly children and animals your goal is to protect victims and prevent more abusers from being formed it's very complicated when it comes to children unfortunately and we don't have a legal system that recognizes it so that becomes problematic but it's something we can all work on yeah definitely um if you have time for another question um um this is just to understand as uh, i mean as a lawyer and someone who's done research on violence i just want to understand um how effective is punishment as a tool for deterrence of further crime um in a place like india um it's not oh sorry sorry finish your question later yeah yeah no that that's my question because i just want to see how effective it is to prevent further crimes further um, criminal behavior violent so behavior I think the nature of punishment is something that is not as relevant as the certainty of punishment. So even if the fine I mean the fine for animal cruelty is 50 rupees no one's going to jail for that unless they've done something really heinous so it's multiple repeated crimes right. So even in the case you report a child for animal cruelty they they're not going to go to prison for it. Um again think of a better way to try and ensure the child is safe and the child gets the healing they need but right now in India it's 50 bucks right? Yeah. yeah that may seem like a negligible penalty right but if you reported it 100% of the time the fact that they have to go to court the fact that they are recognized as an animal abuser etc is a disincentive right when you've been convicted as an animal abuser or convicted as a person who's committed domestic violence etc it does impact your social standing it does cause the pain of going to court it does do all of these really cumbersome tasks and that itself is the deterrent the penalty need not always be the deterrent even the process and the outcome of of being tagged as someone like this is a deterrent so i say report as much as possible particularly for animal cruelty fines you don't even have to feel sad for the person who's getting i mean yeah just just report it because that itself is a penalty now the classification of penalties and which ones work the best is something i haven't studied i think that will be there in criminology in criminal psychology but i i don't i'm not an expert on that i only know that certainty is a very very good deterrent so don't get discouraged by the 50 rupee fine it still has a massive deterrent effect if you can ensure that someone is going to be convicted of animal cruelty every time they do animal cruelty they will stop to think twice whether or not they want to go through that process yeah thank you thank you sonia Ma'am, I have a question. Are there India uh, Indian centric such studies? Uh, and uh, if not, how can someone go about carrying out a study like this? Okay, so firstly, there is the singular India centric study, which is an individual case study. 
So I wouldn't say that's something you can particularly use to prove this. If you wanted to carry out a study like this, I recommend you work with an organization that can. And I would again recommend you connect organizations. So, so um, you will have organizations that work with under trial prisoners. You will have organizations that work on prison welfare. You will have organizations that work on domestic violence, child welfare, child sexual assault, animal cruelty. And you kind of need to get them all to work together because to collect this quantity of massive data, it has to be a unified approach. And that will also give you the most reliable data. So as an individual, it might be difficult to collect this data and work with it. But if you do try and connect to as many different organizations or individuals in different welfare spaces to come up with how to carry out such a massive primary data study. The second thing I would advocate is go back and read the metadata studies and the other studies done in other countries. Um, I did not talk about any of the stuff that they have done through the study. All I talked about was their last bit of conclusion. When you read the studies, general caution, word of caution, they are extremely traumatizing to read because they have the details. Now it is a very good idea to read it if you wanna understand, but have a little bit of self-compassion and um, do, it, do it at your own pace, right? Um, use those studies to understand what kinds of questions they were asking and figure out what survey sets they were using. And then try and see if you can modify it for the Indian context, right? Certain questions will not be applicable in the Indian context. Um, so, so work, work from there. So you, you use the examples of previous studies to kind of design your own study. And then you would ideally go to different organizations, groups, individuals from different welfare spaces to ask them for help in a collecting the data and also checking the questions for that area of specification. And then um, the last stage becomes fun. You get analyze the data. That part's slightly easier than the rest of it, actually. Um, and uh, if any of you want to carry out a study, I really wish you the best. And I would love to read that study. It, it was one of my dreams to do a project like this. But unfortunately, it's a massive undertaking. And it would need a lot of support from a lot of different spaces. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if anybody has any questions or uh, any more questions, you can ask. Sorry to again ask you another question, Sonia. Is the white paper out? Uh, just, no. just so I can share it with other people. No. No, it's not. And um, it's, wait, I, I'll, I'll text you about it later, but uh, it's not out yet. Okay. It's, it's not being published. All right, um, ma'am. Like, uh, how, ma'am? One last question, ma'am. Like, uh, how you have started your journey and your work? Like, you have uh, said that uh, you have done a little bit. Uh, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. so how you get uh, in, uh, interested to work in this field? Okay, so this is a rather long story because it starts when I was like eleven or twelve. Um, when I was around. Yeah, I was 13 years old. Um, okay, trigger warning, everyone. Sorry, animal cruelty. Uh, my dog got run over by this dude in front of my house and uh, I watched her die and I was like 13 years old. And I went online and I was like, man, I want to nail this guy to the cross, right? Because he killed my dog. I was so angry as a 13 year old kid. And I went online and I realized um, the value of my dog was 50 bucks. And I was like, that sucks. Okay, and then I was like, that's a horrible thing to know. And then I read um, a couple of books. A couple of books. An echo. Um, can you just mute your Okay. Um, so, uh, right. So what I was saying was um, after that, I read a bunch of books by a person called Stephen Wise. And he has a great TED talk online if you want to understand the legal framework as to why animals don't have rights. He's an incredible uh, teacher too. So do check out Stephen Wise's work. I read a book by him and he explained to me how fundamentally, no matter how many people cared about animals, if our legal system didn't recognize it, there's very little we could do to protect them. And so instead of 
wanting to just help five animals or 10 animals or 20 or 30, I decided I was going to make a systemic change. So I tried doing that. Um, I worked in law school for animal protection. I interned at animal protection organizations. Uh, people for Animals taught me a lot. They were one of the first people I interned with. Um, I worked with Humane Society International, and then I grew up a little bit. And um, I also got the opportunity to work with Stephen Wise, which was amazing, because um, he was my I, like um, person growing up. And um, I learned a lot from all of those experiences. And then I worked as the manager of the Animal Law Center as well. And it was while I was there that Teja and I started um, researching on the link between animal cruelty and human violence. And um, that kind of started it off for me. And I kind of got obsessed with this topic because all my life, I thought that welfare had to be done in silos. Like either I, I could do um, animal protection or I could do child rights or I could do women's rights or I could do prevention of sexual assault. In my head, all of these issues that I deeply cared about were separate. And the first time they all kind of connected together was while I was working with the Humane Society International India and the Animal Law Center. And that, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. So I continued to work there for a bit um, and it was a wonderful experience and I learned so much and I kept studying about the link between animal cruelty and human violence. It's one of the most fascinating things I've ever studied before. Um, and then I realized that this is a personal opinion, of course. Uh, remember any contribution you can make to any welfare space is important. Okay, so even if all you can do is child rights, that is still making a big difference in the world. All you can do is domestic violence, still making a big difference. All you can do is animal cruelty, environmental protection. It doesn't matter whatever you do, there is an impact. But for me personally, um, I realized that providing children with effective interventions when they were children and, and growing compassion in children was a way I could target multiple factors at the same time and try and reverse engineer the process. So that's when I founded, uh, I co-founded Integro less than a month ago. Um, and we're an education company and uh, we're gonna be opening up schools and online education platforms, which include, uh, which basically make kids develop something called effective compassion, which is not just the feeling of, oh, I, I, I feel bad when an animal is hurt or I feel bad when a woman is hurt, but effective compassion is the desire to act on it as well, right? So not only would they feel bad when an animal is hurt, but they will think and come up with solutions to how to stop that or how to work against that. So that's what I'm kind of working on now. So that's my whole journey. And um, this is only like something I want to do right now while I'm figuring out how to do more research on this area. And I look forward to joining the animal protection movement again soon. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been a real journey. I started off with protecting companion animals, like how a lot of us start off. Then I got obsessed with farmed animals um, because I did uh, site studies of dairy farms and I worked with Mercy for Animals. And I learned so much about farmed animals and they became my passion. By the way, we kill more um, farmed animals in a year than all the humans that have ever existed on planet Earth in entirety. That's the number of number that we're killing is that massive. And remember, there's a human face to the people killing these animals. So um, it, it, and they have an impact too. So the whole, so as you can see, like the little pieces that are kind of coming together, right? Start off small and then you keep widening your scope of welfare. So that's kind of how I did it. And if anyone needs any help, let me know. I'm happy to help put you in touch with people where you can learn. And of course, um, if you do want to get into the animal protection movement or you want to learn more about it, the advanced diploma and the masters at Nalsar is an amazing way to do that. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my little story. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your experiences. Uh, there's one question. Uh, we have short time uh, still. Uh, Sonia is asking, uh, Please do share more about your startup. Okay. And <laughs> um, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure who N is, but okay. So what I will do is I'm just gonna put my email ID in um, the chat box. And in case anyone wants to ask me about 
any of the places I've worked at, um, any of the things I've talked about today or my startup work, I'd be happy to let you know about it. Um, I'm not sure everyone here <laughs> will have the time to because I think the session ended 15 minutes ago. So I won't, it's, it's a long complicated explanation for the startup and how it works. But um, yeah, yeah, no, no worries, Nupur. So, so just uh, text me or um, email me at sonia.chadha.gmail.com and I'd be happy to assist you. And uh, oh, thanks, Nupur. And in case anyone wants links to the studies that I've talked about and Stephen Wise's work, Stephen Wise's work is really easy to find. The Non-Human Rights Project will use an open access. So every petition they file, every research paper they've done, every argument they've ever made is up for free on their website. Um, and of course, there are blogs that are available as well that talk about this. And um, Stephen Weiss has published a couple of books you can order or just go to YouTube and search for Stephen Weiss TED Talk. Those are all great places to um, check that out from. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so uh, can, uh, if you want to add last one line uh, for today's session, uh, so we can end with that, we can end up today's session. All right. Um, firstly, thank you, Akansha. You were very nice as a host, and it was a pleasure to work with you. And uh, same for Rajeshri. And ELC, as always, all my hearts. Um, thank you, everyone. And that's all I have to say for today's session. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I liked uh, for giving your valuable time. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your experiences and your work with us in in this short hours. And uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank Anna Jury for organizing such an interesting session. Lastly, and uh, but not the least, I'd like to thank all the respective participants for making this today's session a grand success. With this, I'm closing your session uh, today's session. Uh, looking forward to meet uh, and hear more about your uh, work, ma'am, in the near future, if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.